Good evening. It's now my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Garland, PhD, LCSW, the Distinguished Endowed Chair in Research, Distinguished Professor and Associate Dean for Research in the University of Utah College of Social Work. In addition, he is Director of the Center on Mindfulness and Integrative Health Intervention Development and the developer of an innovative mindfulness-based therapy, Mindfulness-Oriented Recovery Enhancement. Moore is founded on insights derived from effective neuroscience. Dr. Garland has published more than 240 scientific manuscripts and received more than $80 million in research grants to conduct clinical trials of mindfulness for addictive and chronic pain. In 2019, Dr. Garland was appointed by National Institute of Health Director, Dr. Francis Collins, to the NIH HEAL Multidisciplinary Working Group to help guide the $1 billion HEAL initiative using science to halt the opioid crisis. In a recent bibliometric analysis of mindfulness and research published over the last 55 years, Dr. Garland was found to be the most prolific author of mindfulness research in the world. Welcome, Dr. Garland. Thank you, Robert, and nice to meet you. Thanks for the invitation to speak with you all. I, for some reason, I can't see your faces on my Zoom, um, so I'll just have to assume that you are smiling out there and that, I, <laughs> that I'm smiling back at you. Um, I'll be presenting my work on mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement to you this evening, and I want to save plenty of time for us to have a discussion and answer portion uh, because I want to make this hopefully meaningful to you and as you have questions about how you might apply this intervention in uh, your own practice settings, let's let's have a conversation about it. <clears throat> uh, but to begin, in 2015, Nobel Prize winning economist Case and Deaton found that for the first time in many decades, the U.S. mortality rate was rising precipitously, to which they attributed in large part to the opioid crisis a crisis that has been called a disease of despair in the epidemiological literature. And the disease of despair has many sources from the rising tide of income inequality to the lack of opportunity to intergenerational violence and trauma and the egocentric materialism, social isolation and digital addiction that's such a part of modern culture. To self-medicate against these forms of despair, we seek more and more intense forms of stimulation so we want fancier cars, more elaborate vacations, more likes on social media, but nothing seems to satisfy the insatiable hunger. And so in the face of this vacuum of meaning, it was perhaps inevitable that life would become more painful. And, and indeed it did. Rates of chronic pain soared in the U.S. where an estimated 50 million Americans experience pain each year. And to alleviate this epidemic of pain, opioid prescriptions climbed. In 2015, 38% of the U.S. adult population was prescribed an opioid that year. I just think that's a really staggering number. <clears throat> and this dramatic increase in the, in, in the rising uh, incidence of opioid prescriptions was paralleled by increased prevalence of opioid misuse and opioid use disorder. And, and this problem uh, remains huge today. So our latest prevalence estimates from the federal government show that in 2022, 8.5 million Americans misused prescription opioids and 6.5 million Americans had an opioid use disorder. And of the 8.5 million Americans who engaged in opioid misuse, 41% of them obtained the opioid uh, from a healthcare provider. And so that tells me that chronic pain is still fueling the opioid crisis in part. But I want to begin with a clinical anecdote. A patient came to see me for help with chronic pain and opioid related problems. He had received a series of five failed back surgeries and after each one had been prescribed higher and higher doses of opioids. He knew he had a problem with opioids. He knew he was taking too high of a dose. But as he so poignantly stated to me, I just don't want to be in pain. I asked him to tell me about a time when he wasn't in so much pain or maybe when his pain didn't bother him at all. And he told me that on the weekends when his grandkids came over and he watched them play in the backyard, he became so focused and so absorbed in watching them play that it brought joy to his heart. And in that moment, he didn't notice his pain. His pain was temporarily gone. 
and so was his desire for opioids. And this clinical anecdote is probably familiar to those of you who work with patients like this, but I think it hints at a potential therapeutic mechanism that could be leveraged to help halt the opioid crisis. To understand this claim, we need to understand the role that hedonic dysregulation plays in pain, pleasure, and addiction. In Western philosophy, pleasure and pain are considered opposites on a hedonic balance, such that increasing experiences of pain are thought to outweigh the experience of pleasure in everyday life. Neurobiology suggests that pleasure and pain actually operate through a common emotional currency in the brain, mediated by the mesocorticolimbic dopamine circuit and the endogenous opioid system. And these same brain systems that, that mediate and control pleasure and pain, they become hijacked by addictive drugs like opioids through an allostatic process in which chronic exposure to drugs causes neuroplastic changes in the brain that increase sensitivity to pain, stress, and drug-related cues and decrease sensitivity to the pleasure and meaning derived from naturally rewarding objects and events in the social environment. So in other words, as the person becomes more and more dependent on opioids just to feel okay, they become less able to extract a natural, healthy sense of pleasure, joy, and meaning out of everyday life. And this drives them to take higher and higher doses of the drug just to preserve a dwindling sense of well-being. And this cycle eventually can become completely out of control. The person loses self-control and then develops in an opioid use disorder. <clears throat> But we know that not everybody who takes opioids misuses them or becomes addicted to them. In fact, most people don't. So it's a really interesting question. Why can some people take the opioid as prescribed by their physician, whereas other people go on to misuse the opioids or become addicted to them? To answer this question, I used <clears throat> tasks from cognitive neuroscience in my laboratory. And uh, I know it's around dinner time here, so uh, hold your lunch with this picture. So. In the dot probe task, we have a computer screen and it's split in two. On one side of the screen is a pain related image. On the other side of the screen is a neutral image. And these images are displayed for a very brief amount of time, about a fifth of a second. Then they disappear and a dot pops up. And the participant's task is to choose the side with the dot. And then the computer measures reaction times. It turns out that people with chronic pain are faster to find the dot when it replaces a pain related image than when it replaces a neutral image. And this indicates that their attention is fixated on or biased towards pain-related information. We also pair neutral images and naturally rewarded positive images. And we pair opioid images and neutral images. And about a decade ago, <clears throat> my research group was the first to find that people with chronic pain who had an opioid use disorder were faster to find the dot when it replaced an opioid image than when it replaced a neutral image, indicating that they too have an attentional bias towards opioid-related cues. And this opioid attentional bias has significant clinical consequences. It predicted the extent to which a patient would relapse following 20 weeks after behavioral treatment. So this is essentially a way to measure the extent to which a patient is being triggered by addictive cues in the laboratory. And these data show that opioid misuse is linked with increased sensitivity to opioid-related cues. But in my lab, we also measure hedonic dysregulation with another task. This is called the emotion regulation task. In this task, we present patients with emotional images. In response to this image of this mother and child screaming in fear, negative emotional images, we ask patients to either view the image or to reappraise the image by reframing the meaning of the content of the image in such a way as to reduce its negative emotional impact. So to reappraise this image, one might think the mother and child faced the tragedy, but in facing the tragedy, it brought them closer together, together as a family. And if you, if you were to change the way you were thinking about this image like this, this might make it less upsetting. In response to positive emotional images like this father and son at the beach, <clears throat> uh, we ask patients either to view the image or to savor the image by mindfully focusing their attention on what is pleasant, beautiful, and good in the image and appreciating and trying to amplify any positive emotions or pleasurable body sensations 
arising during the savoring practice. And <clears throat> during this task, we measure a whole array of psychophysiological processes. So a number of years ago, my colleagues and I found that relative to patients who take opioids as prescribed, here shown in these blue bars, opioid misusing chronic pain patients shown in the red bars had significant blunting of parasympathetically mediated heart rate variability during reappraisal, viewing positive images, and savoring positive images, indicating that they have a deficit in the ability to shift their emotions in a positive direction. And we find converging evidence with EEG here in the top center panel in blue, you can see brain waves from people who don't misuse opioids. These folks are able to decrease their brain's reactivity to the negative emotional stimuli by reappraisal. You see here the line shifts down. They're able to calm their brain down in response to the stimulus. And beneath in red are brain waves from people who misuse opioids. Not only can they not reappraise effectively, but actually when they engage in reappraisal, it backfires and it aggravates their negative emotional brain reactivity. And all the way in the right, you can see brain waves during positive emotion regulation. Here in blue, these are brain waves from people who don't misuse opioids. They're able to increase their brain's activity from viewing positive images to savoring positive images. They're able to make themselves feel better naturally. And in red, you can see brain waves from people with opioid use disorder. So here you just see total blunting of brain response during positive emotion regulation. And these deficits in negative and positive emotion regulation are associated with higher levels of opioid craving and predict opioid misuse in the future. So if this is part of the problem, if this inability to make oneself feel better, to regulate emotions, is actually driving opioid misuse and addiction, then we need therapies that can address this problem. <clears throat> and to that end, I developed mindfulness-oriented recovery enhancement, or MORE. MORE is an integrative mind-body therapy that unites three great traditions within psychotherapy. Uh, the first is mindfulness training, the second is cognitive behavioral therapy, and the third is positive psychology. <clears throat> and so MORE weaves these therapeutic traditions together into a, a treatment that can simultaneously address addictive behavior, emotional distress, and chronic pain. And I know this is a mindfulness group here. I know you probably know a lot about mindfulness, <clears throat> but I wanna just briefly offer you my definition of this construct. So in my view, mindfulness is a form of mental training involving the practice of cultivating awareness and acceptance of thoughts, emotions, and sensations in the present moment, and observing your mental experience as if you were a witness, this position of meta-awareness, this awareness of awareness. The practice of mindfulness is very simple. We begin by focusing our attention on an object. It could be any object. It's typically we start with focusing on the breath and then the mind begins to wander. And then we notice that the mind has wandered. And then we acknowledge and accept that thought or feeling. And finally, we let it go and return the focus of our attention back to the object of mindfulness. And so in doing this, we've done a single loop of mindfulness. Many people think that mindfulness is merely focusing attention on the object, that sustaining attention is, is the practice of mindfulness. But in actuality, the entire loop of mindfulness is the practice, because with each iteration of this loop, we're cultivating the mind's capacity for meta-awareness, the awareness of awareness. And that really, in my, in my view, is the active ingredient in mindfulness. You know, a lot of people think of mindfulness as a relaxation therapy, but it's not. Mindfulness is all about generating awareness and using that awareness to increase self-regulation. So with mindfulness as its foundation, more is a sequence treatment. It begins with, with this, with this uh, rootedness in mindfulness, which by virtue of strengthening attentional control and meta-awareness is then used to synergize more elaborate therapeutic text, techniques like reappraisal and savoring, and ultimately, to lead to self-transcendence, the sense of being connected to something greater than the self. These treatment components are intended to activate a series of therapeutic mechanisms 
that are in turn intended to produce clinically significant change in treatment targets relevant to chronic pain, opioid misuse, and addiction. And I would add here that more has been tested as a treatment for a wide array of addictive behaviors, <clears throat> but this talk is really going to focus on more as an intervention for the opioid crisis. But I just want to let you know that there has been research uh, looking at more as a treatment for other substance use disorders as well. So more is typically delivered as a group therapy over eight weekly sessions. The group sessions are two hours long. They begin with a formal mindfulness meditation practice, followed by a debrief and group process, which is just exquisitely important for helping patients to consolidate what they've learned and then apply that learning to uh, addressing uh, their symptoms of addiction, emotional distress, and chronic pain in daily life. After the debrief, new psychoeducational material is delivered, and then sessions end with an experiential exercise, so some sort of mind-body practice designed to hammer home the concepts that you're trying to teach. Then participants are asked to practice homework, consisting of 15 minutes of mindfulness, reappraisal, and or savoring practice a day. They're also asked to stop before they take opioids or other drugs, or if they're in treatment and receiving medication-assisted treatment, they're asked to stop and then practice a couple of minutes of mindfulness before taking the medication or the drug. And we call this technique the stop technique. <clears throat> so the technique is quite simple. The first step is S, to stop right before you take your medicine or drugs. Then number two, T, take a few minutes to practice mindful breathing to calm down the mind, to calm down the body. And then number three, to observe your thoughts and feelings and body sensations. Now imagine if you are a person with chronic pain who is prescribed opioids, but who, be, who may be misusing opioids. And let's say you, you're, you have to take your pill every three to four hours and you've been in between doses and you have another 20 minutes left. So you're getting pretty antsy waiting to take your next dose. And then the time finally comes to take the dose. You take, you grab your pill bottle, you take the lid off, you pull the Oxycontin out of the bottle, you bring it before your face. And I ask you just stop. And instead of taking the pill, as you normally do as part of your automated habitual routine, you stop and bring full mindfulness of this activity and, uh, and, and prevent yourself from actually carrying out the habit in this moment. What do you think you'll notice in your mind and your body? You'll probably begin to notice feelings of craving or irritation or anxiety. You also might begin to notice how your attention keeps getting pulled by the sight of the, of the drug. And that even though you're trying to focus on your breath, it's hard to concentrate because your mind keeps getting drawn back to the desire to take the drug. You can also begin to er observe that it's possible to have an urge, but you don't have to give in to the urge. And then <clears throat> finally, the last step is P, to proceed with intention. So if, if the patient decides to take the drug, then just recognize that they're putting a powerful chemical in their brain and their body. And this act deserves respect, attention, and awareness. If the patient's prescribed medication-assisted treatment like methadone or buprenorphine, uh, then, then take the time to really contemplate how you're taking a life-saving medication and recommit yourself to your recovery. So now I want to talk about how we teach patients to manage pain in the more therapy. So people with chronic pain typically experience pain as this emotionally laden, monolithic, and unremitting experience. It's this terrible, awful thing that always seems to be there. And on top of that, they overlay a layer of suffering. They say to themselves, why me? This isn't fair. This pain is ruining my life. In more, patients are taught mindfulness skills to remove this emotional overlay and then to decompose the pain experience into its subcomponent sensations. So rather than suffering from some terrible, awful anguish in the body, we teach patients mindfulness skills to zoom into that pain experience and to break it down into sensations of heat or tightness or tingling, as well as to notice the spaces in between those sensations where there's either no sensation at all or potentially pleasant sensations right next to the painful ones. Using mindfulness to cultivate interoceptive awareness, the awareness of the physical condition of the body, may actually re reduce emotional bias during pain appraisal 
and thereby make pain hurt less. And we teach patients a very similar technique to cope with craving, breaking the craving down into its cognitive, emotional, and sensory components. Okay, so now I want to talk about one of the techniques in more that makes this therapy quite unique. In more, patients are taught a mindful savoring technique. They're guided to focus mindful awareness on a rose, appreciating the pleasant colors, textures, and scent of the flower, as well as the touch of the petals against the skin. And during this practice, patients are guided to cultivate a metacognitive reflective attitude and to become aware of, appreciate, and amplify any positive emotions, pleasurable body sensations, or emotional meaning that arises during the savoring practice. Then they're asked to practice this technique at home with other naturally occurring pleasant everyday events. And this technique is intended to amplify natural reward processing in the brain, boost positive emotions, elicit meaning in life, and cultivate self-transcendence, the sense of interconnectedness between the self and the world. So through the integration of mindfulness reappraisal and savoring techniques, more aims to modify associative learning mechanisms that have become hijacked during the allostatic process of addiction by strengthening top-down conscious cognitive control to restructure reward learning from valuing drug-related rewards back to valuing natural rewards. And this therapeutic focus is in line with what I call my restructuring reward hypothesis, which states that shifting, helping the patient to shift from valuing drug-related rewards back to valuing natural rewards will reduce craving and addictive behavior. And in my view, not only as an addiction scientist, but also as a psychotherapist who's worked with people with substance use disorders for about 20 years now, I think this is really the essential therapeutic task in addiction recovery. The person in recovery must relearn what is and what is not important in life, what is and what is not meaningful in life. And they need to reclaim that sense of meaning that, they, <clears throat> that, they, that has been stolen by the drug uh, from the, the people, the activities, and the values that they once cared about, and then reinvest that sense of meaning back into their lives. Okay, so I've given you a lot of theory about the more intervention, but let me give you some data. You know, more is an evidence-based practice. Um, more has been shown to be efficacious in over 12 randomized controlled trials involving more than 1,300 patients. Meta-analyses have shown that more produces statistically significant effects on reducing addictive behaviors, psychiatric symptoms, and chronic pain relative to a range of different active control conditions. So I want to highlight some of the key studies for you in the more research program now. Uh, we'll begin with the first NIH-funded randomized control trial of more for chronic pain and opioid misuse. In this study, there are 115 chronic pain patients. They've been taking opioids for about 10 years. Three quarters of the sample reported misusing opioids, and there were high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD in this sample. In summary of the findings, more led to significantly greater reductions in chronic pain severity and pain-related interference compared to the supportive group psychotherapy control group. If you're not familiar with pain research, pain interference measures how much pain interferes with a person's activity level, their mood, their walking, their work, their relationships, their sleep, and their enjoyment of life. And we, we also showed in this study that the effect of more on reducing pain severity was statistically explained by the ability to view pain not as pain, but rather, rather as pure sensory information. So patients who went through more were able to see their pain, not really as pain, but rather as sensations of heat or tightness or tingling. And the greater they were able to do this, the greater the pain relief they achieved. And we've shown this pattern in multiple clinical trials, same, same thing, that in more patients are learning how to use mindfulness skills to, uh, to see their pain, not really as pain, but rather as just harmless sensory information. And the more they can do that, the greater the pain relief they achieve. In this study, we also showed that more significantly reduced opioid misuse symptoms. There was a 63% reduction in the more group compared to a 32% reduction 
in the supportive group therapy condition. So more was about twice as good as standard therapy. And in this study, we also uh, measured hedonic dysregulation using the dot probe task, the same task that I talked to you about earlier. And we found the first evidence in the scientific literature from a randomized controlled trial that a mindfulness-based intervention could reduce the pain attentional bias. So after eight weeks of treatment with more, patient's attention was less captured by, less fixated on pain-related information. <clears throat> we also found that more significantly decreased the opioid attentional bias. And we recently actually replicated this in a second study with a larger sample. So we're seeing pretty clearly here that more is decreasing the extent to which patients are being triggered by opioid-related cues. But some of the most interesting findings from the study came from heart rate data collected during this task. And I don't think you really need to know any statistics at all to see that there's something big going on here. You can see that across all three Q conditions of the task, patients treated with more showed significantly greater heart rate decelerations than patients in the control group. Not surprisingly, the more patients' heart rate slowed as they viewed the opioid photographs and the pain photographs, the less aroused, the less stimulated, the less triggered they felt by those images. But we found the opposite pattern in response to the pleasurable photographs. The more patients' heart rate slowed as they viewed the pleasurable photographs, the more aroused, the more stimulated they felt by those images. And so we took this to mean that maybe more was increasing physiological sensitivity to natural pleasure. So we wanted to understand the clinical implications of these findings. And, you, and, as, and as clinicians, you guys might be wondering, you know, who cares about this heart rate stuff? <clears throat> well, to answer this, we, we conducted a multivariate path analysis and found that the effects of more on reducing opioid craving were statistically mediated or statistically explained by changing the heart rate response to the pleasure cue condition, not by changing the heart rate response to the opioid cue condition. So in other words, more was reducing opioid craving by enhancing physiological responsiveness to natural pleasure. And this represented the most significant scientific finding of my career to this point. Um, I think you can appreciate this if you remember that the, the prevailing model of addiction neuroscience states that as a person becomes more and more addicted, they become less sensitive to natural healthy pleasure and this drives them to take higher and higher doses of the drug just to feel okay. Well, these data suggest that that cycle might be reversed, that by teaching people how to mindfully savor natural healthy pleasure, this might reduce opioid craving and thereby decrease addictive behavior. And so this was a really big deal finding. I think it led to the subsequent funding of more than $30 million in federal research grants uh, because it really suggested that the brain changes that are occurring in addiction potentially could be healed. So in this study, we also collected ecological momentary assessments. So what that means is we ask patients uh, to record their pain levels and their mood state up to four times a day uh, whenever they took their opioid medication. And so this gives you a tremendous amount of data, about 224 time points over the course of the treatment. And we found that more was decreasing pain from moment to moment in everyday life. We also found that more was increasing positive emotions from moment to moment in everyday life. In fact, patients treated with more had 2.75 times the odds of those <clears throat> in, uh, in standard group therapy to be positively emotionally regulated over the course of treatment. What does that mean? It means that if I'm in a bad mood in this moment, I'm able to make myself feel better in the next moment. Or if I'm in a good mood in this moment, I'm able to preserve that good mood in the next moment. And interestingly, it wasn't the decreases in pain that predicted reduced opioid misuse, but rather patients who showed the largest increases in positive emotions uh, reported the greatest decreases in opioid misuse. And that provided support for my restructuring reward hypothesis. This idea that if we can teach people how to make themselves feel good naturally, they'll have less craving and engage in less addictive behavior. Okay, so let's take stock. What do we know? We know that more seems to decrease addictive behavior and craving and uh, the extent to which patients are triggered by drug-related cues. 
we also see that more appears to decrease pain. And at the same time, more seems to increase positive emotions and natural reward processing. So I wanted to replicate these results. And so we conducted a second stage two randomized controlled trial for patients uh, taking opioids in primary care. And once again, we found that more significantly decreased chronic pain and opioid misuse. But in this study, we also showed that more increased an array of positive psychological processes, including positive emotions, savoring, meaning in life, and self-transcendence. And the effects of more on reducing pain severity and opioid misuse were associated with increases in these positive psychological functions. And that suggests that one way to treat the disease of despair of opioid addiction may be to teach people how to savor natural, healthy joy, meaning, and self-transcendence in everyday life. Around this time, we were also starting to wonder whether more can improve outcomes in patients uh, receiving medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. So my colleague, Nina Cooperman <clears throat> from Rutgers University and I uh, were awarded an NIH grant to conduct a pilot randomized controlled trial of more for patients in methadone treatment in inner city, New Brunswick, New Jersey. <clears throat> this was in a uh, predominantly black and Latinx sample in, in, uh, in folks with a pretty low education level, high levels of exposure to traumatic violence. It was a small study, so we didn't expect to see a significant effect, but we did. We found that more led to significantly fewer days of opioid use, fewer days of drug use, less chronic pain, and lower depression levels. More also decreased the intensity of craving by 50% by the end of treatment. And so we were really encouraged, but we wanted to follow this study up with, with a larger study. And so we, we conducted a second NIH-funded trial uh, in, in, a, in a larger sample of patients receiving methadone treatment in the community. And this study started at the onset of COVID-19, so we had to rapidly pivot and switch to delivering more through telehealth through Zoom. And in this larger sample, <clears throat> we actually found that more significantly improved addiction treatment outcomes. So patients who got more had a lower, lower risk of relapse back to drug use. They had a lower rate of dropout from addictions treatment. They had fewer days of opioid use and drug use compared to people who received uh, methadone treatment without more, and more also improved adherence to methadone treatment. So th these data were really exciting. They just got published in the journal JAMA Psychiatry, and they suggest that more is an efficacious treatment for opioid use disorder. And so we need to consider this therapy as an adjunct to, to standard addictions care. And if we do that, maybe we can actually improve treatment outcomes and reduce, reduce risk uh, relapse in this population. And around this time, we were also really interested in, in kind of getting under the hood and starting to understand the neurophysiological mechanisms by which more was producing its treatment effects. So we brought patients into the lab and we had them participate in an opioid Q reactivity task. So we showed them photographs of opioids on a computer screen and we recorded their brain activity with EEG. And, we, and uh, here in the red line, you can see the brain's response to viewing an opioid cue before treatment. Here in the blue line, you can see the brain's response to viewing the opioid cue after eight weeks of treatment with more. So you can see that more just significantly decreased the brain's reactivity to the opioid cue. And on the right, you can see brain waves from patients going through standard supportive group therapy. So you see not much of a difference at all between pre and post treatment. And if you have trouble reading the squiggly lines, here's a bar chart that shows the effect. So more just produced a massive decrease in brain drug Q reactivity. This is the first time from a randomized controlled trial in the scientific literature that a mindfulness-based intervention has been shown to reduce drug Q reactivity in the brain. But we also wondered if more could decrease the brain's response to drug-related rewards, could it increase the brain's response to natural healthy rewards? And so in a separate mechanistic experiment, we found that more increased EEG responses and skin conductance responses. Skin conductance is what's used in the lie detector test. It, it measures physiological arousal. We found that more increased both brain and body 
responses during viewing and savoring of natural reward cues. We also found that more just made people feel happier when they viewed these images of smiling babies, lovers holding hands, beautiful sunsets. And the effect of more on reducing opioid misuse by the three month follow up point was statistically explained by increases in this responsiveness to natural healthy pleasure. So these data, again, provided really strong support for my restructuring reward hypothesis. This idea that if we can teach people how to make themselves feel better naturally, make themselves feel good by appreciating the beauty in, in, the, in the world around us, that they will feel less of a pull towards the drug-related rewards, and then that will decrease their addictive behavior. Okay, so let's take stock again. What do we know? We know that more seems to decrease addictive behavior and craving. At the same time, more appears to decrease pain, but more also seems to increase positive emotions, natural reward, and meaning in life. And these effects seem to be link linked with increases in self-regulation and self-transcendent experiences. So this brings me to the largest randomized controlled trial of more ever conducted. This was the study was published in the top medical journal JAMA Internal Medicine in 2022. In the study, there were 250 chronic pain patients, all of whom were prescribed opioids and all of whom were misusing opioids. They were randomized to receive eight weeks of more or eight weeks of a supportive group therapy control condition. Patients reported average pain levels of 5.5 out of 10. They were taking high opioid doses, 101 morphine milligram equivalents a day. Three quarters of the sample reported having two or more chronic pain conditions. And there were high rates of psychopathology in this sample, with about 70% of people meeting criteria for major depression, 62% had a full-blown opioid use disorder, 21% had a non-opioid substance use disorder, and there are high rates of generalized anxiety and PTSD as well. And in summary of the findings, more reduced opioid misuse by 45% at the nine-month follow-up point, nearly tripling the effect of standard group therapy. More also reduced opioid dosing and significantly decreased opioid craving. And so I think these data clearly demonstrate Moore's efficacy as a treatment for opioid misuse. We also found that more significantly decreased chronic pain symptoms and emotional distress. And the effects that we observed for more in reducing pain exceed those observed for the current gold standard psychological treatment for chronic pain, CBT. We also found that more improved an array of of psychological health factors. So more had powerful antidepressant effects. If you recall, about 70% of patients met criteria for major depression at the beginning of the trial. But by nine months after being treated with more, patients' depression symptom score no longer surpassed the cut point for major depression. More also had uh, significant effects on reducing PTSD symptoms. 59% of patients who met criteria for PTSD reported experiencing clinically significant reductions in PTSD symptoms. And at the same time, more improved positive emotions, meaning in life, and self-transcendence. So these data suggest that more is a broad spectrum treatment that can not only address addictive behaviors and chronic pain, but can also treat the psychiatric conditions that are often uh, comorbid with these problems. And I like to replicate my work. So we wanted to really do another large, rigorous clinical trial to confirm these results. And so in a, in a grant funded by the Department of Defense, we did a, a full-scale randomized control trial of more for veterans and military personnel with chronic pain who are on long-term opioid therapy. And once again, through an eight-month follow-up, we found that more outperformed supportive group psychotherapy in reducing chronic pain symptoms and opioid use. There's a 21% reduction in opioid use in the more group compared to a 4% reduction in the supportive group therapy condition. We also found that patients in more had a lower rate of, of uh, positive drug urine screens at a 12 month follow up point. And at the same time, more significantly improved opioid craving, pain catastrophizing, and anhedonia. So these data uh, fully support the notion that more isn't efficacious treatment for chronic pain and opioid misuse. But we've also shown that more increases healthy 
self-generated reward responses. So this is a computerized body map. And on the body map, patients locate pleasant and unpleasant sensations. Pleasant sensations are represented in blue. Unpleasant sensations are represented in red. And this is a single-sided body map. So it represents a summation of the sensations on the back and the front of the body. You can see here that more massively increases sensations of pleasure in the body and powerfully shifts the ratio of pleasant to unpleasant sensations. So at the beginning of the study, patients reported experiencing about one pleasant sensation for every four unpleasant sensations. And I just find that really sad. It speaks to how much these folks were suffering. But six months after being treated with more, patients reported two pleasant sensations for every one unpleasant sensation, suggesting that more teaches people how to internally self-generate natural healthy feelings of pleasure and thereby shift the body from being a place of anguish to becoming a place of refuge. And finally, we were interested in whether states of self-transcendence that were achieved during deep uh, meditation might have anti-addictive properties. So with the veterans from my DOD funded trial, we brought them into the lab and had them practice mindfulness meditation while we recorded their brain activity with EEG. And we, we found that patients treated with more showed significant increases in frontal midline theta EEG activity during meditation. Higher levels of theta were correlated with more intense experiences of self-transcendence, and they mediated the effect of more on reducing opioid use through a four-month follow-up point. We know that frontal midline theta increases when a person is in a deep state of concentration, but it also increases during states of flow when the sense of self is temporarily suspended and transcended during deep cognitive absorption with an ongoing activity. So these data suggest that mindfulness meditation may actually be a means of self-stimulating the prefrontal cortex to enhance really self-control, self-regulation over addictive behavior. And again, I always like to replicate my work when I can. So we replicated these results in the largest neuroscientific study of mindfulness as a treatment for addiction ever conducted. This study was published in 2022 in the top journal Science Advances. In a sample of 165 chronic opioid users, we brought them into the lab and had them practice mindfulness while we recorded their brain activity with EEG. And I just love data like this because you don't need any statistics at all. You know, look at this, this these, these four brain maps here. So here's the game. Which one of these four is not like the other? You know, that's this one right here. That's the brain after eight weeks of more. We just saw massive increases in frontal midline theta EEG activity. And once again, higher levels of theta were associated with more intense self-transcendent experiences and mediated the effect of more on reducing opioid misuse through a nine-month follow-up. So replicating these results across two independent randomized controlled trials with two independent samples tells me that maybe we have really found a key mechanism by which mindfulness reduces addictive behavior. Okay, so let's summarize. So what do we know? We know that more is an efficacious treatment for addictive behavior and craving. And at the same time, more reduces physical and emotional pain, but more also enhances positive emotions, reward and meaning in life. And these effects are linked with increased self-regulation strength and uh, self-transcendent experiences. So taken together, these data support the restructuring reward hypothesis. This idea that if we increase sensitivity to natural, healthy pleasure, joy, meaning, and transcendence, it will come to outweigh the pull of drug-related reward and thereby reduce addictive behavior. So in conclusion, more is an efficacious treatment for addiction Distress and chronic pain is demonstrated by 12 randomized controlled trials involving more than 1,300 patients. We've learned a lot about how more works over the past 10 years. More's mechanisms of action include reducing drug Q reactivity, increasing natural reward processing, strengthening self-regulation, and eliciting self-transcendence. And given this solid evidence base for this therapy, it's really time to disseminate more. And I'm really dedicating a lot of my career to this at to this point, which is why I'm talking to all of you tonight. So I've trained more than 850 clinicians from around the US and internationally 
who are now delivering more in their, in their clinical practice settings. So I've trained social workers, psychologists, nurses, physicians, um, and many of these folks are now receiving insurance reimbursement for delivering this intervention. My goal is really to get it out there. I want to, I want to use this, this <clears throat> evidence-based approach to help as many people as, as we can. But ultimately, teaching people how to take in the good and mindfully savor natural healthy pleasure may provide the learning signal needed to restore adaptive hedonic regulation and ultimately to reverse addiction. And I know that's a bold claim, but we're facing a serious crisis in this country. And so I sincerely hope that my work has, has helped in, in, in some regard. So I wanna thank you for your attention. I wanna thank the funders of my work. I wanna let you know that I'm, I am doing a more training pretty soon on March 22nd and March 23rd. Training is gonna be held by Zoom. Um, and so if you're interested in, in attending, just shoot me an email. And, um, and now we have plenty of time for questions. So <clears throat> happy to answer any questions that you have. Is that a question, Chris? Well, first I was just celebrating. <laughs> but I, but I do have a ton. I think uh, Gary was in, in before me. I'm going to stabilize my internet too. Um, I'll just throw this out there quickly because um, we're working. Many of the people on the screen are working with prison populations. I didn't see a stat in there, but um, what percentage of the prison population? Um, are the are people incarcerated due to addiction or opioid use? Good, good question. I don't know. I don't. I don't have that statistic off the top of my head. I'd imagine it's pretty high, though. Do you have? Have you considered, or is there any? Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say. Um, actually, back in January, I, I headed out to. Massachusetts to train a bunch of, of clinicians who worked in, in the correctional setting, uh, people who worked in the jail and the prison, and also in probation, um, trained folks from Western Massachusetts. And uh, that was exciting. So now, there, now there's some correctional facilities out, out there that are starting to implement this therapy. Did you work with Franklin County? Uh, I don't. Where I, I, I don't. That's really, Western Mass. I was just curious. Probably, probably. Yeah, they do some good work. A, a lot of people have are getting off like heavy drugs there, and they they really help them rehab and everything. It might have. Been, I, I'm not too familiar with Massachusetts. We did the training in in Northampton, but there were there were folks from the Berkshires. And oh right, yeah, the both jails. Yeah, I'm familiar with both places. There's two jails in that area. Dr. Garland, uh, there's a question or in in chat from Chris about asking if there's an obstacle to extending training to recovery coaches uh, and community health workers. And I believe in your communication with me, you had indicated you have actually worked with recovery coaches uh, and done some training in the state of New Jersey. I believe it was correct. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have. I have trained some uh, some peer support recovery uh, coaches in New Jersey. And um, I, I, th I think I trained about 20 folks. So there is, there is a precedent for that. Um, I, th I think peer recovery folks could learn this protocol and could do some good with it. It is, it is a fairly uh, sophisticated therapy. And so I think it, that uh, a well-trained psychotherapist um, can 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 do this therapy quite well, and I think peer support folks could could do it. Maybe they can't do it as well as a as a licensed therapist, but they could still probably do some good with it. Have you? I'll just follow up. I think I'm stable now. With one my, have you ever thought of a? Does it? Can you foresee um, it being manualized? It is, oh, I'm so sorry that, to mention it. It is a manualized therapy. Okay. It's, it's completely manualized. So the all the scripts of what to what to say in terms of the psychoeducation 
Um, they're all scripted out. The, the mindfulness techniques are all scripted out. So uh, that helps in terms of people of different training levels to deliver this therapy. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, the, the uh, first version of the more treatment manual was published in 2013 by NASW Press. Um, and I was going to show you my book, but I don't see it on my shelf. Uh, but the, and the next version of the book is going to be published in, this summer by Guilford Press. Thanks. And just to say, this is very exciting. Uh, I am, in addition to being a recovery coach, uh, um, and among this esteemed group of folks, uh, I'm really active with the uh, Recovery Dharma Fellowship Movement. And so this is just, uh, it sounds like um, the evidence that we've all been waiting for. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I know. And there are a lot of people that are using mindfulness-based therapies in, in, in the substance use world. But like you said, we've been lacking solid evidence behind it. And so I, I think that's a, that's a strong contribution for more. You know, the other piece is obviously there are some, some novel parts of more uh, that don't show up in a lot of other mindfulness-based therapies, like savoring, for example, and savoring seems to be really important in the treatment of addiction. Uh, Dr. Garland, uh, Vita has her hand up. Yeah, I, I'm sorry if I missed this, but what type of therapy did you do the comparisons with? Was it MBCT or something like that, or was it? Oh, good question. So most, for most of our studies, the control group was uh, supportive therapy. So like a, like a Rogerian client-centered therapy, you know, the therapist just gets patients to talk about their emotions, provide each other with social support, um, a lot of active listening, but not uh, mindfulness. We didn't compare more to a different mindfulness therapy. Is there any plans on doing that? Because that would be interesting to see. It would be interesting. Um, I, I currently have a, a, a large scale study to compare the full more intervention to just a simple mindful breathing intervention. Um, because that's obviously that's a big question in my mind. All the all the extra bells and whistles and stuff that we do in more, is it really worth it? Or could you get the same effect with just a simple basic mindfulness practice? Mm -hmm. I hope the answer is no. <laughs> I hope the answer is all the all the uh, the complicated stuff we do in this therapy is worthwhile. Um, but we'll find out. So that, that study is being done in methadone treatment uh, clinics in Utah and in New Jersey. And I mean, it sounds like you're familiar with Rick Hansen and his work too, but I'm, I don't think he does research on his work the, with the language you're using the, is familiar to his. But are you familiar? I'm sure you're familiar with Judson Brewer's work. So have you? what do you think of his work on? He has a different approach to hedonic tone and working with reward. Yeah. yeah. What, what do I think about it? I... Yeah. I you know, I, we don't, we do not agree on this topic. Um, and, uh, but it's not really agreement or disagreement because it's just, what does the data show? Right. And so the data, as, as I've tried to demonstrate to you guys, the data consistently shows that in, that increasing hedonic pleasure to natural healthy pleasure actually reduces addictive behavior. So I haven't seen any argument against that. I haven't seen any data arguing against it. Yeah, Dr. Garland, I was really taken uh, by many pieces, but the, particularly the stop, uh, that, that sort of pattern interrupt that you've, that you've uh, put together. And now, I believe you said it's an eight-week program. So at what point in that program would you be introducing STOP and how would you be able to reinforce that, seeing as that could be really a challenge? Yeah, great question. So we, we actually introduced that at the very beginning. So that's in the first week. But I, maybe I didn't explain this well. We're not asking patients to stop and then not take the drug. We're, we're asking them to just stop before taking the drug and bring mindful awareness to that act. And then if they decide to not take the drug, then great, they decide to not take the drug. But if they decide to take the drug, that's their choice too. So we're just asking them to, to put a pause in this automatic habit to bring some awareness into this habit and then, um, and then proceed as, as whatever, to do whatever they think is right. But that does become the choice point where many people who start to change their substance use 
it's in those early stop practices when they start to realize some things about why why they've been taking the drug in the first place. So, for example, if 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 you're talking about somebody who, let's say, they they're prescribed opioids, but they're also misusing the opioid or starting to become addicted to the opioid, a lot of these folks feel very justified in taking the medi medication because they say, "Hey, I've got a prescription. A doctor gave it to me. Um, I'm just taking this for pain." But when they do this practice, they often start to discover that actually they're taking the pill for reasons other than pain. Like they're taking it because they're upset, they're stressed, they're depressed, they're anxious. Or many people start to discover they're taking this pill because they're experiencing craving or they're trying to ward off craving. Or they're taking it simply out of habit, even at times when they don't even necessarily need to take it. Mm -hmm. So those kind of early moments of practicing the stop technique starting to give the patient insight into um, how and why they're using the drugs that they're using. Oftentimes that is the springboard to getting people to start to change their behavior. That's not actually the full uh, mindfulness of craving technique. So we do teach a, a mindfulness of craving meditation, uh, but that doesn't come until the fifth, fifth session because that takes a lot more stability of mind um, and mindfulness to be able to do successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still uh, quite a sophisticated uh, strategy and skill to work with. I'm wondering, do you, do you provide uh, materials for them? Is there like a, a infographic that they can work with when they get the pill out and they have something they can refer to? Are they just working out of memory or how are they actually? Yeah, they're just working out of memory. That infographic is a good idea, though. I like that idea. You can have it. Thanks. <laughs> Can you, I mean, can I you noticed, Dr. tell Garland, me what, how you define self-transcendence? That I, I, You kind of lost me on that one. Like, that sounds I, like a spiritual term. It is a spiritual term. Yeah, definitely. And you're researching spiritual terms. Okay, go ahead. What, how do you define it? Re, you know. Yeah, definitely researching. Scientifically. <laughs> how do you define it scientifically? So yeah. we, measure, we measure it. You can only measure it as self-report because it's psychological experience. So this is, we ask patients questions like, when you were practicing mindfulness, to what extent did your sense of self begin to dissolve away? Zero to 10. One, to what extent did you feel a sense of oneness with all things? Zero to 10. To what extent did you experience a blissful warmth or energy coursing through your body? Zero to 10. So we measure it with questions like that. And amazingly enough, uh, people actually report having these experiences, even, even novices report having these experiences and increases in this, in these self-transcendent experiences are associated with Im improved clinical outcomes. And, you know, they're associated with these brain changes that I showed you. So when I, when I started to see that pattern in the data, it, it, it uh, really kind of blew me away. And so now I'm studying this in earnest. And there's lots of, it seems like there's a lot of uh, research now, a lot of the research are coming out in terms of therapy and counseling and all of these sort of psycho, psychotherapy modes are included in spirituality. They're finding that that making a profound impact on on care for folks. So it's, a, it's an important part that's been ignored uh, all along and it's making a powerful difference for people. I totally agree with you. And, you know, in terms of addiction treatment, that's, that's, Classically, it's been a big part of this. Like in the twelve-step tradition, it's it's a highly spiritual approach, um, <clears throat> but we just haven't paid much attention to that dimension in in science. So actually, collecting these data and showing for the first time that when you have these types of spiritual experiences, that it it actually can improve your health outcomes. That's that's pretty exciting to me. It, mean, it means we have to put more energy into understanding this phenomenon. I know we're getting uh, close to time, actually, probably over time, Dr. Garland, but there was one question or one uh, in chat I wanted to direct your attention to, and that was the uh, the question by Mr. Young about how does more interact with PTSD uh, affected first responders today? Oh, I don't know. We, we haven't studied more as, a, as an intervention for first responders. That would be, a, that'd be an interesting thing to do. We have shown that more decreases PTSD symptoms quite significantly. And what's amazing about that is that uh, 
we're not actually ever addressing the trauma directly. We're not doing trauma processing in the more therapy, but nonetheless, learning the, the basic skills of mindfulness, reappraisal and savoring seem to decrease, not seem to, they did, they did decrease the PTSD symptoms. So um, I'm actually, one of these days when I get, get around to it, I'd like to develop a trauma informed version of more where we're actually doing direct processing of trauma but combining it with the, the skills and more, and then we'll probably get an even more powerful effect. Thank you. Welcome.